Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the members for their comments and support of this bill. Uh, let me now address their comments and queries. I'll first address Mr. Lewis Young's question regarding uh, why we are amending Section 18D of the Supreme Court of Judicature Act. Um, and in relation to this, uh, Mr. Ng's and Professor Madev's questions on the jurisdiction of the Singapore International Commercial Court. Mr. Lewis Ng correctly pointed out that the International Arbitration Act, the IAA, provides that the High Court is the competent court to hear matters relating to international commercial arbitration and that the SCJA provides that the SICC has the High Court's original civil jurisdiction. Uh, with respect to the wording of Section 18D of the SAJA, uh, although we have felt that it was clear, from time to time we do get some questions as to the wording and its extent, and really we felt that rather than have any lingering doubt about this, it would be better to clarify it and make it uh, clear from the outset uh, to avoid unnecessary uh, litigation on this going forward. And so, um, to reassure Mr. Lewis Ng, uh, we are not extending or conferring additional jurisdiction upon the SICC. Uh, what we are doing is clarifying its existing jurisdiction. Uh, this is clear from the explanatory statement for the bill, which says that the bill seeks to amend the Supreme Court of Judicature Act to provide for clarity that the Singapore International Commercial Court has jurisdiction to hear any proceedings relating to international commercial arbitration that the High Court may hear. Professor uh, Madev Mohan asked if the SICC will now be able to sit as the curial court in investment arbitration award-related cases under the IAA. The intent of these amendments is for the SICC to hear IAA-related cases that the High Court can hear subject to the proceedings fulfilling the relevant jurisdictional requirements and conditions. The conditions will be set out in the rules of court, which help to define the SICC's jurisdiction as necessary. The rules of court are still in the process of being drafted, and uh, Professor Madhav Mohan's suggestion will be carefully considered. This brings me to Mr. Ng's and Mr. Murali Pillay's questions on the conditions and definitions which will be prescribed in the rules of court. Clause 4B allows the rules of court to prescribe what constitutes an international commercial arbitration and such other conditions that any proceedings must satisfy. The specific rules of court are still being drafted. Once they are completed, they will have to go to the Rules Committee, which is chaired by the Chief Justice. Whatever the eventual shape and form of the definitions and conditions, the rules of court, being subsidiary legislation, cannot enlarge the jurisdiction of the SICC as provided for in the SCJA. They can only serve to define or refine it. I come now to pre-action certification. Clause 3 of the bill deals with the removal of the pre-action certification procedure. Mr. Ng and Mr. Pillay have raised questions about the rationale for removing the procedure. The pre-action certification was envisaged as an option that parties could use to certify, amongst other things, that the intended action is international and commercial in nature and can therefore be heard by the SICC. However, the feedback received from the Supreme Court has been that the procedure has been of limited utility, um, and it is certainly not the case that the Supreme Court has required that the pre-action certificate be applied for in every SICC case. Mr. Pillay suggested that the pre-action certification procedure helps to promote certainty uh, compared to other methods for classifying a matter as an offshore case, as it allows for the classification to be made at an early stage. The need for the pre-action certification procedure was more compelling when the SICC was first established because there was concern that parties might have been uncertain about whether the SIC, SICC even had jurisdiction or whether the case was an offshore case with no substantial connection to Singapore. Since then, the SICC has generated case law to clarify that the requirement of offshore case, to clarify the requirement of offshore cases, and there is a greater familiarity with the SICC. Potential users of the SICC can continue to direct their questions, or, or they are free to direct their questions prior to the commencement of the case to the SICC registry for general guidance, including on issues relating to jurisdictional criteria, 
with the caveat that this does not constitute legal advice. They can also refer to the SICC practice directions. Let me round off my response by addressing Professor Madhav Mohan's other questions and comments in relation to the SICC. The SICC has done well as a trailblazer for dispute resolution in Asia. Since its establishment three years ago, the SICC has broadened the suite of dispute resolution options available to regional and international parties and established a track record of producing sound and expeditious judgments. I thank Professor Mohan for raising the issue of enforcement, which we recognize is a key ingredient in the success of the SICC. The Ministry continually works with the Supreme Court on arrangements to provide for the recognition of Singapore Court judgments, including SICC judgments in other jurisdictions. So, for example, Singapore is a party to the Hague Convention on Choice of Courts Agreement. The Convention currently has three contracting parties, including Singapore, Mexico and the European Union and its member states, except for Denmark. Last year, China signed the Convention, joining the US, Ukraine and Montenegro as signatories to the Convention. As the number of contracting parties to the Hague Convention grows, the SICC's reach will expand as well. Outside of treaty arrangements, the enforcement of judgments is also possible in many countries, including Singapore, so long as applicable and necessary requirements, for example, jurisdictional requirements, are met. But these are early days still for the SICC and the international commercial litigation in Asia. I do not have on hand statistics of contracts where SICC clauses have been inserted, but we have heard anecdotally of high profile users inserting SICC clauses into their contracts and are heartened by this. It will take some time, obviously, because contracts go in, I mean, the clauses go into the contracts in early stage. You don't know when the dispute will arise. Uh, sometimes it can be a few years, sometimes even decades before a dispute surfaces. So it will take some time before we see uh, more reference to the SICC clauses. <clears throat> so just to illustrate this point about it taking some time, if you take, if you look at our success in arbitration as a reference, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, or SIAC, was established in 1991, but it only started to see success years later. Today, of course, it is one of the top arbitral institutions in the world, and this has come about due to the changes in the international landscape and the concerted efforts from the Singapore government and key stakeholders. The amendments proposed in this bill follow our consistent approach in assiduously refining the services that we have to offer. One possibility why the SICC has yet to hear arbitration-related matters could be precisely the uncertainty over whether the SICC has jurisdiction to hear IAA matters. So we've clarified that, and we expect that with these amendments, the users will find Singapore an even more attractive seat for arbitration. We will continue to support the SICC in its efforts to educate and raise awareness to users on what it has to offer. As awareness of what the SICC has to offer and the SICC's reputation grows, users will become more familiar with the SICC and will be attracted to adopt the SICC jurisdictional clauses. The SICC will also continue to refine and improve its services to continue to meet the needs of users. And in that respect, I welcome Professor Madhav Mohan's various suggestions, uh, including the one on the possible conversion of money judgments to arbitral awards. We'll take into consideration these suggestions as the SICC continues to evolve and grow. It's our belief that we need to keep our ears close to the ground so that we can move quickly, respond to user feedback as appropriate. And so I do welcome Professor Mohan's feedback, as well as that from the businesses, professions, and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I beg to move.